Part 1, Chapter 1 of The Marriage of William Ash. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. Part 1, Acquaintance. Headed, Just oblige me and touch with your scourge of that minx Chloe, but don't hurt her much. Chapter 1 He ought to be there, said Lady Tramore, as she turned away from the window. Mary Lister laid down her work. It was a fine piece of church embroidery, which, seeing that it had been designed for her by no less a person than young Mr. Byrne Jones himself, made her the envy of her pre-Raphaelite friends. Yes, indeed. You made out there was a train about twelve. Certainly. It can't have taken more than an hour to speechify after the decoration of the pole. And I know William meant to catch that train if he possibly could. And take his seat this evening? Lady Tramore nodded. She moved restlessly about the room, fidgeting with a book here and there, and evidently full of thoughts. Mary Lister watched her a little longer, then quietly took up her work again. Her air of well-bred sympathy, the measured ease of her movements, contrasted with Lady Tramwell's impatience. Yet in truth, she was listening no less sharply than her companion to the sounds in the street outside. Lady Tramwell made her way to the window, and stood there looking out on the park. It was the week before Easter, and the plane trees were not yet in leaf. But a few thorns inside the park railings were already lavishly green, and there was a glitter of spring flowers beside the park walks, not showing, however, in such glorious abundance as became the fashion a few years later. It was a mild afternoon, and the drive was full of carriages. From the bow window of the old irregular house in which she stood, Lady Tramwell could watch the throng passing and repassing, could see also the traffic in Park Lane on either side. London, from this point of sight, wore a cheerful, friendly air. The dim sunshine, the white clouded sky, the touches of reviving green and flowers, the soft air blowing in from the farther window which was open, brought with them impressions of spring, of promise and rebirth, which insensibly affected Lady Tramwell. Well, I wonder what William will do this time in Parliament, she said, as she dropped again into her seat by the fire and began to cut the pages of a new book. He's sure to do extremely well, said Miss Lister. Lady Tramwell shrugged her shoulders. My dear, do you know that William has been for eight years, since he left Trinity, one of the idlest young men alive? He had one brief. Yes, somewhere in the country where all the juniors get one in turn, said Lady Tramwell. That was the year he was so keen and went on circuit and never missed a sessions. Next year, nothing would induce him to stir out of town. What has he done with himself all these eight years? I can't imagine. He has grown uncommonly handsome, said Mary Lister, with a momentary hesitation as she threaded her needle of thresh. I never remember him anything else, said Lady Tramwell. All the artists who came here, and to narrow ways, wanted to paint him. I used to think it would make him a spoiled little ape, but nothing spoiled him. Miss Lister smiled. You know, Cousin Elizabeth, and you may as well confess it at once, that you think him the ablest, handsomest, and charmingest of men. Of course I do, said Lady Tramwell calmly. I am certain, moreover, now, that he will be Prime Minister. But as for idleness, that, of course, is only a fuss or de parler. He has worked hard enough at the things which please him. There, <laughs> you see, said Mary Lister, laughing. Not politics, anyway, said the elder lady, reflectively. He went into the house to please me because I was a fool, wanted to see him there. But I must say, when his constituents turned him out last year, I thought they would have been a mean-spirited set if they hadn't. They knew very well he'd never done a stroke for them. Tendencies, divisions, perfectly scandalous. Well, here he is, in triumphantly for somewhere else, with all sorts of delightful prospects. Lady Tramwell sighed. Her white fingers paused in their task. That, of course, is because, now... He's a personage. Everything will be made easy for him now. My dear Mary, they talk of England as being a democracy. The speaker raised her handsome shoulders. 
Then, as though to shake all thoughts of loss and grief which had suddenly assailed her, she abruptly changed the subject. Well, work or no work, the first thing we've got to do is to marry him. She looked up sharply. But not the smallest tremor could she detect in Mary Lister's gently moving hand. There was, however, no reply to her remark. Don't you agree, Polly? said Lady Trammell, smiling. Her smile, which still gave great beauty to her face, was charming, but a little sly, as she observed her companion. Why, of course, said Miss Lister, inclining her head to one side, that she might judge the effect of some green shade she had just put in. But that surely will be made easy for him, too. Well, after all, the girls can't propose, and I never saw him take any interest in a girl yet. Outside his own family, of course, added Lady Tranmore hastily. No, he does certainly devote himself to the married women, replied Miss Lister, in the half-absent tone of one more truly interested in her embroidery than in the conversation. He would sooner have an hour with Madame Destray than a week with the prettiest miss in London. That's quite true, but I advise the girls' own fault. They should stand on their dignity, snub the creatures more. In my young days... Ah, there wasn't a glut of us then, said Mary calmly. Listen, she held up her hand. Yes, said Lady Tramwell, springing up. There he is. She stood waiting. The door flew open, and in came a tall young man. William, how late you are, said Lady Tramwell, as she flew into his arms. Well, mother, aren't you pleased? Her son held her at arm's length, smiling kindly upon her. Of course I am, said Lady Tramwell. And you, are you horribly tired? Not a bit. Ah, Mary, how do you do? Miss Lister had risen, and the cousins shook hands. But I don't deny it's very jolly to come back out of all that beastly scrimmage, said the new member, as he threw himself into an armchair by the fire with his hands behind his head, while Lady Tramwell prepared him a cup of tea. I expect you've enjoyed it, said Miss Lister, also moving towards the fire. Well, when you're in it, there's a certain excitement in wondering how you're going to come out of it. But one might say that, of course, of the infernal regions. Not quite, said Mary Lister, smiling demurely. Polly, you are a Tory. Everybody else's hell has moved but yours. Thank you, Mother. Lady Trammell gave him tea. Then, stretching out his great frame in lazy satisfaction, he turned his brown eyes from one lady to the other. I say, Mother, I haven't seen anything as good-looking as you, or Polly there, if she'll forgive me, for weeks. Hold your tongue, Goose, said his mother, as she replenished the teapot. What? There were no pretty girls? Not one? Well, they didn't come my way, said William, contentedly munching at bread and butter. I've gone through all the usual humbug, and perjured my soul in all the usual ways, without any consolation worth speaking of. Don't talk nonsense, sir, said Lady Tramore. You know you like speaking, and you like compliments, and you've had plenty of both. You didn't read me, mother. Didn't I? she said, smiling. He groaned, and took another piece of tea cake. My own family, at least, don't you think, might admit that. <laughs> Sir, so you don't believe a word of your own speeches? said Lady Tramwell, as she stood behind him and smoothed his hair back from his forehead. Well, who does? He looked up gaily and kissed the tips of her fingers. And it's in that spirit you're going back into the house? Mary Lister threw him the question with a slight pinching of the lips as she resumed her work. Spirit? What do you mean, Polly? One plays the game, of course, and it has its moments, its hot corners, so to speak. Oh, I suppose no one would play it. And the girl? She lifted a gently disapproving face in a movement which showed anew the large comeliness of head and neck. Why, to keep the other fellows out, of course. He lifted an arm and drew his mother down to sit on the edge of his chair. Will you be not to talk like that? said Lady Tramwell decidedly, laying her cheek, however, against his hand the while. It was all very well when you were quite a freelance, but now... Oh, never mind, Mary, she's discreet, and she knows all about it. What? that they're thinking of giving me Hickson's place. Parham has just written to me. I found the letter downstairs, to ask me to go and see him. Oh, it's come, said Lady Tramwell, with a start of pleasure. Lord Parham was the Prime Minister. Now don't be a humbag, William, and pretend you're not pleased. But you'll have to work, mind. 
she held up an admonishing finger. You'll have to answer letters, mind. You'll have to keep appointments, mind. Shall I? Ah, Hudson. He turned. The butler was in the room. His lordship, my lady, would like to see Mr. William before dinner, if he could make it convenient. Certainly, Hudson, certainly, said the young man. Tell his lordship I'll be with him in ten minutes. Then, as the butler departed, How's father, mother? Oh, much as usual, said Lady Tramwell sadly. And you? He laid his arm boyishly round her waist, and looked up at her, his handsome face all affection and delight. Mary Lister, observing them, thought them a remarkable pair. He, in the very prime and heyday of brilliant youth, she, so beautiful still, in spite of the filling out of middle life, which indeed was at the moment somewhat toned and disguised by the deep mourning, the sweeping crepe and dull silk in which she was dressed. "'I'm all right, dear,' she said, quietly, putting her hand on his shoulder. "'Now go on with your tea. Mary, feed him. I'll go and talk to father till you come.' She disappeared, and William Ash approached his cousin. "'She is better,' he said, with an anxiety that became him. "'Oh, yes, your election has been everything to her, and your letters. "'You know how she adores you, William.' "'Ash drew a long breath. "'Yes, isn't it bad luck? "'William! Uh, for her, I mean. "'Because, you know, I can't live up to it. "'I know it's her doing, bless her, "'that old Parham's going to give me this thing. "'It's a perfect scandal. "'What nonsense, William!' It is, he maintained, springing up, standing before her, with his hands in his pockets. They're going to offer me the under secretaryship for foreign affairs. I shall take it, I suppose, and be thankful. Do you know, he dropped out the words with emphasis, that I don't know a word of German, and I can't talk to a Frenchman for half an hour without disgracing myself. <laughs> That's how we're governed. He stood staring at her with his bright, large eyes, amused yet strangely detached as though he had very little to do with what he was talking about. Mary Lister met his look in some bewilderment, conscious all the time that his neighbourhood was very agreeable and stirring. But everyone says you speak so well on foreign subjects. Well, any fool can get up a blue book. Only, luckily for me, all the fools don't. That's how I've scored sometimes. Oh, I don't deny that. I've scored. He thrust his hand deeper into his pockets, his whole tall frame vibrant, as it seemed to her, with will and good humour. And your score again, she said, smiling. You've got a wonderful opportunity, William. That's what the bishop says. Much obliged to him. Ash looked down upon her rather oddly. He told me he had never believed you were such an idler as other people thought you, that he felt sure you had great endowments, and that you would use them for the good of your country, and... She hesitated slightly. Of the church. I wish you'd talk to him sometimes, William. He sees so clearly. Oh, does he? said Ash. Mary had dropped her work, and her face, a little too broad, with features a trifle too strongly marked, was raised towards him. Its pale colour had passed into a slight blush. But the more strenuous expression had somehow not added to her charm and her voice had taken a slight nasal tone. Through the mind of William Ash, as he stood looking down upon her, passed a multitude of flying impressions. He knew perfectly well that Mary Lister was one of the maidens whom it would be possible for him to marry. His mother had never pressed her upon him, but she would certainly acquiesce. It would have been mere mock modesty on his part not to guess that Mary would probably not refuse him. And she was handsome, well provided, well connected. Impressively so, indeed. A man might quail a little before her relations. Moreover, she and he had always been good friends, even when as a boy he could not refrain from teasing her for a slow coach. During his electoral weeks in the country, the thought of Polly had often stolen kindly upon his rare moments of peace. He must marry, of course. There was no particular excitement or romance about it. Now that his elder brother was dead and he had become the heir, it simply had to be done. And Polly was very nice, quite sweet-tempered and intelligent. She looked well, moved well, and filled the position admirably. Then, 
suddenly, as these half-thoughts rushed through his brain. A breath of something cold and distracting, a wind from the land of Inui, seemed to blow upon them and scatter them. Was it the mention of the bishop, tarsome, pompous fellow, or a slightly pedantic tone, or the infinitesimal hint of management that her speech implied? Who knows? But in that moment, perhaps the scales of life inclined. Much obliged to the bishop, he repeated, walking up and down. I'm afraid, however, I don't take things as seriously as he does. Oh, I hope I shall behave decently. Good Lord, what a comedy it is. You know the sort of articles, he turned towards her. Our papers will be writing tomorrow on my appointment. They'll make me out no end of a fine fellow, you'll see. And of course, the real truth is, as you and I know perfectly well, that if it hadn't been for poor Freddy's death, and his mother, and her dinners, and the chaps who come here, I might have whistled for anything of the sort. And then I go down to Lebanon, and stand as a liberal, and get all the pious radicals to work for me. <laughs> it's a humbugging world, isn't it? He returned to the fireplace, and stood looking down upon her, grinning. Mary had resumed her embroidery. She, too, was dimly conscious of something disappointing. Of course, if you choose to take it like that, you can she said, rather tartly. Of course, everything can be made ridiculous. Well, that's a blessing anyway, said Ash, with his merry laugh. But look here, Mary, tell me about yourself. What have you been doing? Dancing? Riding, eh? He threw himself down beside her, and began an elder brotherly cross-examination, which lasted till Lady Trammell returned, and begged him to go at once to his father. When he returned to the drawing-room, Ash found his mother alone. It was growing dark, and she was sitting idle, her hands in her lap, waiting for him. I must be off, dear, he said to her. You won't come down and see me take my seat? She shook her head. I think not. What did you think of your father? I don't see much change, he said, hesitating. No, he's much the same. And you? He slid down on the sofa beside her and threw his arm round her. Have you been fretting? Lady Trammell made no reply. She was a self-contained woman, not readily moved to tears. But he felt her hand tremble as he pressed it. I shan't fret now, she said after a moment, now that you've come back. Ash's face took a very soft and tender expression. Mother, you know, you think a great deal too much of me. You're too ambitious for me. She gave a sound between a laugh and a sob, and, raising her hands, she smoothed back his curly hair and held his face between them. When do you see Lord Parham? she asked. Eight o'clock in his room at the house. I'll send you up a note. You'll be home early? No, don't wait for me. She dropped her hands after giving him a kiss on the cheek. I know where you're going. It's Madame Destro's evening. Well, you don't object. Object? She shrugged her shoulders. So long as it amuses you, you won't find one woman there tonight. Last time there were two, he said, smiling as he rose from the sofa. I know. Lady Quantock and Mrs Mallory. Now they've deserted her, I hear. What fresh gossip has turned up, I don't know. Of course, she sighed. I've been out of the world, but I believe there have been developments. Well, I don't know anything about it, and I don't think I want to know. She's very agreeable, and one meets everybody there. Everybody? Ungallant creature, she said, giving a little pull to his collar, the set of which did not please her. Sorry, mother, his laughing eyes pursued her. Do you want to marry me off directly? I know you do. I want nothing but what you yourself should want. Of course you must marry. The young women don't care tuppence about me. William, be a bear if you like, but not an idiot. Perfectly true, he declared. Not the dazzlers and the high flyers, anyway. The only ones it would be an excitement to carry off. You know very well, she said slowly, that now you might marry anybody. He threw his head back rather haughtily. Oh, I wasn't thinking about money and that kind of thing. Well, give me time, mother. Don't hurry me. 
and now I'd better stop talking nonsense, change my clothes, and be off. Goodbye, dear. You shall hear when the job's perpetrated. William, really, don't say these things, at least to anybody but me. You understand very well, she drew herself up rather finely, that if I hadn't known, in spite of your apparent idleness, you would do any work they sent you to do, to your own credit and the country's, I'd never have lifted a finger for you. William Ash laughed out. Oh, intriguing mother, he said, stooping again to kiss her. So you admit you did it. He went off gaily, and she heard him flying upstairs three steps at a time, as though he was still an untamed Eton boy, and there were no three weeks hard political fighting behind him, and no interview which might decide his life before him. He entered his own sitting room on the second floor, shut the door behind him, and glanced round him with delight. It was a large room looking on a side street and obliquely to the park. Its walls were covered with books, books which almost at first sight betrayed to the accustomed eye that they were the familiar companions of a student. Almost every volume had long paper slips inside it, and when opened would have been found to contain notes and underlinings in a somewhat reckless and destructive abundance. A large table, also loaded untidily with books and papers, stood in the centre of the room. Many of them were notebooks, stored with evidences of the most laborious and patient work. The Cambridge texts lay beside them face downward as he had left it on departure. His mother's housekeeper, who had been one of his best friends from babyhood, was the only person allowed to dust his room, but on the strict condition that she replaced everything as she found it. He took up the volume and plunged a moment headlong into the Greek chorus that met his eye. Jolly, he said, putting it down with a sigh of regret. These beastly politics. And he went muttering to his dressing room, summoning his valet almost with ill temper. Yet half his library was the library of a politician, admirably chosen and exhaustively read. The footman who answered his call understood his moods and served him at a look. Ash complained hotly of the brushing of his dress clothes and worked himself into a fever over the set of his tie. Nevertheless, before he left, he managed to get from the young man the whole story of his engagement to the under-housemaid, giving him thereupon some bits of advice, jocular but trenchant, which James accepted with a readiness quite unlike his normal behaviour in the circles of his class. End of Part 1, Chapter 1book 1 chapter 2 of the marriage of william ash by mary augusta ward this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers book 1 chapter 2 ash took his seat dined and saw the prime minister these things took time and it was not till past 11 that he presented himself in the hall of madame d'estre's house in st james's place most of her guests were already gathered but he mounted the stairs together with an old friend and an old acquaintance, Philip Darrell, one of the ablest writers of the moment, and Lewis Harmon, artist and man of fashion, the friend of duchesses and painter of portraits, a person much in request in many worlds. "'What a cachet they have, these houses,' said Harmon, looking round him. "'St. James's place is the top.' "'Where else would you expect to find Madame d'Estre?' asked Darrell, smiling. Yes, what taste she has. However, it was I, really, who advised her to take the house. Naturally, said Darrell. Harmon threw a dubious look at him, then stopped a moment, and with a complacent proprietary air straightened an engraving on the staircase wall. You advise her about her house? Somebody else helps her to buy her wine? Not at all, my dear fellow, said Harmon, offended, as if I couldn't do that. Hello, said Darrell, as they neared the drawing room. What a crowd there is! Or, as the butler announced them, the din of talk which burst through the door implied indeed a multitude, much at their ease. They made their way in with difficulty, shaping their course towards that corner of the room where they knew they should find their hostess. Ash was greeted on all sides with friendly words and congratulations, and a passage was opened for him to the famous blue sofa where Madame d'Estre sat enthroned. She looked up with animation, broke off her talk with two elderly diplomats who seemed to have taken possession of her, and beckoned Ash to a seat beside her. 
So you're in. Was it a hard fight? A hard fight? <laughs> no. One would have had to be a great fool not to get in. They say you spoke very well. I suppose you promised them everything they wanted, from the crown downward. Yes, all the usual harmless things, said Ash. Madame Destre laughed, then looked at him across the top of her fan. Well, and what else? You can't wait for your newspaper, he said, smiling after a moment's pause. She shrugged her shoulders good-humouredly. Oh, I know, of course I know. Is it as good as you expected? As good as... The young man opened his mouth in wonder. What right had I to expect anything? How oh, modest. All the same, they want you, and they're very glad to get you. But you can't save them. That's not generally expected of undersecretaries, is it? A good deal is expected of you. I talked to Lord Parham about you last night. William Ash flushed a little. Did you? Very kind of you. Not at all. I didn't flatter you in the least. Nor did he. But they're going to give you your chance. She bent forward and lightly patted the sleeve of his coat with the fingers of her very delicate hand. In this sympathetic aspect, Madame Destre was no doubt exceedingly attractive. There were, of course, many people who were not moved by it, to whom it was the conjuring of an arch-pretender. But these were generally of the female sex. Men, at any rate, lent themselves to the illusion. Ash certainly had always done so, and tonight the spell had still worked, though as her action drew his particular attention to her face and expression, he was aware of slight changes in her which recalled his mother's words of the afternoon. The eyes were tired. At last he perceived in them some slight signs of years and harass. Up till now her dominating charm had been a kind of timeless softness and sensuousness, which breathed from her whole personality, from her fair skin and hair, her large smiling eyes. She put, as it were, the question of age aside. It was difficult to think of her as a child. It had been impossible to imagine her as an old woman. Well, this is all very surprising, said Ash, considering that four months ago I did not matter an old shoe to anybody. That was your own fault. You took no trouble. Besides, there was your poor brother in the way. Ash's brow contracted. No, that he never was, he said with energy. Freddy was never in anybody's way, least of all mine. You know what I mean, she said hastily, and you know what friends he and I were, poor Freddy. But after all, the world's the world. Yes, we all grow on somebody's grave, said Ash. Then, just as she became conscious that she jarred upon him, and must find a new opening, he himself found it. Tell me, he said, bending forward with a sudden alertness, who is that lady? He pointed out a little figure in white, sitting in the opening of the second drawing room. A very young girl, apparently, surrounded by a group of men. Ah, said Madame Destre, I was coming to that. That's my girl Kitty. Lady Kitty, said Ash in amazement. She's left school. I thought she was quite a little thing. She's eighteen, isn't she, darling? Don't you think her very pretty? Ash looked a moment. Extraordinarily bewitching, unlike other people, he said, turning to the mother. Madame Destres raised her eyebrows a little in apparent amusement. I'm not going to describe Kitty. She's indescribable. Besides, you must find her out. Do go and talk to her. She's to be half with me, half with her aunt, Lady Grosville. Ash made some polite comment. Oh, don't let's be conventional, said Madame Destre, flirting her fan with a little air of weariness. It's an odious arrangement. Lady Grosfield and I, as you probably know, are not on terms. She says atrocious things of me, and I... The fair hair fell back a little, and the white shoulders rose with the slightest air of languid disdain. Well, bear me witness that I don't react, Tariate. It's not worth while. But I know the Grosville house can help Kitty, so... Her gesture, half ironical, half resigned, completed the sentence. Does Lady Kitty like society? Kitty likes anything that flatters or excites her. Then of course she likes society. Anybody as pretty as that. Ah, oh, how sweet of you, said Madame Destre softly. How sweet of you. I like you to think her pretty. 
I like you to say so. Ash felt and looked a trifle disconcerted, but his companion bent forward and added, I don't know whether I want you to flirt with her. You must take care. Kitty's the most fantastic creature. Oh, my life now will be very different. I find she takes all my thoughts and most of my time. There was something extravagant in the sweetness of the smile which emphasised the speech, and, altogether, Madame Destre, in this new maternal aspect, was not as agreeable as usual. Part of her charm perhaps had always lain in the fact that she had no domestic topics of her own, and so was endlessly ready for those of other people. Those indeed who came often to her house were accustomed to, to speak warmly of her unselfishness, by which they meant the easy patience with which she could listen, smile and flatter. Perhaps Ash made this tacit demand upon her, no less than other people. At any rate, as she talked cooingly on about her daughter, he would have found her tiresome for once, but for some arresting quality in that small, distant figure. As it was, he followed what she said with attention, and as soon as she had been recaptured by the impatient Italian ambassador, he moved off, intending slowly to make his way to Lady Kitty. But he was caught in many congratulations by the road, and presently he saw that his friend Darrell was being introduced to her by the old habitué of the house, Colonel Warrington, who generally divided with the hostess the lead of these social evenings. Lady Kitty nodded carelessly to Mr. Darrell, and he sat down beside her. That's a cool hand for a girl of eighteen, thought Ash. She has the airs of a princess, except for the chatter. Chatter, indeed. Wherever he moved, the sound of the light's hurrying voice made itself persistently heard through the hum of male conversation. Yet once, Ash looking round to see if Darrell could be dislodged, caught the chatter as silent, and found himself all at once invaded by a slight thrill or shock. What did the girl's expression mean? What was she thinking of? She was looking intently at the crowded room, and it seemed to Ash that Darrell's talk, though his lips moved quickly, was not reaching her at all. The dark brows were drawn together, and beneath them the eyes looked sorely out. The delicate lips were slightly, piteously open, and the whole girlish form in its young beauty appeared, as he watched, to shrink together. Suddenly the girl's look, so wide and searching, caught that of Ash, and he moved impassively forward. "'Present me, please, to Lady Kitty,' he said, catching Warrington's arm. "'Poor child,' said a low voice in his ear. Ash turned and saw Lewis Harmon. The tone, however, elusive, intimate, patronising, in which Harmon had spoken, annoyed him, and he passed on without taking any notice. Lady Warrington, said Warrington, Mr. Ash wishes to be presented to you. He's an old friend of your mother's. Congratulate him, he's just got into Parliament. Lady Kitty drew herself up, and all trace of the look which Ash had observed disappeared. She bowed, not carelessly, as she had bowed to Darrell, but with a kind of exaggerated stateliness, not less girlish. I never congratulate anybody, she said, shaking her head, till I know them. Ash opened his eyes a little. How long must I wait? he said, smiling, as he drew a chair beside her. That depends. Are you difficult to know? She looked up at him audaciously, and he on his side could not take his eyes from her, so singular was the small, sparkling face. The hair and skin were very fair like her mother's, the eyes dark and full of fire, the neck most daintily white and slender, the figure undeveloped, the feet and hands extremely small. But what arrested him was, so to speak, the embodied contradiction of the personality, as between the wild intelligence of the eyes and the extreme youth, almost childishness, of the rest. He asked her if she had ever known anyone confessed to being easy to know. Well, I'm easy to know, she said carelessly, leaning back, but then I'm not worth knowing. Is one allowed to find out? Oh, yes, of course. Do you know, when you were over there, I willed that you should come and talk to me, and you came. Only, she sat up with animation and began to tick off her sentences on her fingers. Don't ask me how long I've been in town. Don't ask me where I was in Paris. 
Don't declare whether I like balls. You see, I warn you at once, she looked up frankly, that we mayn't lose time. Well, then, I don't see how I'm ever to find out, said Ash stoutly. Whether I'm worth knowing, she considered, then went forward eagerly. Look here, I'll just tell you everything in a lump, and that and that'll do, won't it? Listen, I'm just eighteen. I was sent to the Sir Blanche when I was thirteen, the year Papa died. I didn't like Papa. I'm very sorry, but I didn't. However, that's by the way. In all those years, I've only seen Maman once. She doesn't like children. But my Aunt Grosville has some French relations. Very, very comme il faut, you understand. And I used to go and stay with them for the holidays. Tell me, did you ever hunt in France? Never, said Ash startled and amused by the sudden glance of enthusiasm that lit up the face and expressed itself in the clasped hands. Oh, it's such heaven, she said, lifting her shoulders with an extravagant gesture. Such heaven! First there are the old dresses. Men look such darlings. And then the horns and the old ways they have. Si noble, si distingué. Not like your stupid English hunting. And then the dogs. Ah, the dogs! shoulders went higher still. Do you know, my cousin Henri actually gave me a puppy of the great breed, the breed, you know, the dogs of St. Hubert. Or at least he would, if Mamma would have let me bring it over. And she wouldn't. Just think of that. When there are thousands of people in France who give the eyes out of their head for one. I cried all one night. Allons, faut pas si penser. She shook back the hair from her eyes with an impatient gesture. My cousins have got a chateau, you know in the seine et was. They promised to ask me next year, when the Grand Duke Paul comes, if I promise to behave. You see, I'm not a bit like French girls. I had so many affairs. Her eyes flashed with laughter. Ash laughed too. Are you going to tell me about them also? She drew herself up. No, I play fair always. Ask anybody. Oh, I do want to go back to France so badly. Once more, she was all appeal and childishness. Anyway, I won't stay in England. I've made up my mind to that. How long has it taken? A fortnight, she said steadily. Just a fortnight. That hardly seems time enough, does it? said Ash. Give us a little longer. No, I, I, I hate you, said Lady Kitty, with a strange drop in her voice. Her little fingers began to drum on the table near her, and to Ash's intense astonishment, he saw her eyes fill with tears. Suddenly a movement towards the other room set in around them. Madame Destro could be heard giving directions. A space was made in the large drawing room, a little table appeared in it, and a footman placed thereon a glass of water. Lady Kitty looked up. Oh, that detestable man, she said, drawing back. No, I can't. I can't bear it. Come with me. And... Beckoning to Ash, she fled with precipitation into the farther part of the inner drawing-room, out of her mother's sight. Ash followed her, and she dropped panting and elate into a chair. Meanwhile, the outer room gathered to hear the recitation of some verse de Société, fondly believed by their author to be of a very pretty and pridean mate. They certainly amused the company, who laughed and clapped as each niche personality emerged. Lady Kitty passed the time either in a running commentary on the reciter, which occasionally convulsed her companion, or else in holding her small hands over her ears. When it was over, she drew a long breath. How oh, Maman can! Oh, how bit you English are to applaud such a man! You have only one poet, haven't you? One living poet? Ah, oh, I shouldn't have laughed if it had been he. I suppose you mean Geoffrey Cliff, said Ash, amused. Nobody abroad seems ever to have heard of anyone else. Well, of course, I just long to know him. Everyone says he's so dangerous. He makes all the women fall in love with him. That's delicious. He shouldn't make me. Do you know him? I knew him at Eton. We were switched together, said Ash. She inquired what the phrase might mean, and when informed, flushed hotly, denouncing the English school system as quite unfit for gentlemen and men of honour. Our French cousins would sooner die than suffer such a thing. Then, in the midst of her tirade, she suddenly paused, and fixing Ash with her brilliant eyes, she asked him a surprising question. 
in a changed and steady voice. Is Lady Tranmore not well? Ash was fairly startled. Thank you, I left her quite well. Have you? Did Mamma ask her to come tonight? It was Ash's turn to redden. I don't know, but we are in mourning, you see, for my brother. Her face changed and softened instantly. Are you? I'm so sorry. I, I always say something stupid. Then Lady Tramwell used to come to Mamma's parties before. She grew quite pale. It seemed to him that her hand shook. Ash felt an extraordinary pang of pity and concern. It's I, you see, to whom your mother has been kind, he said gently. We are an independent family. We each make our own friends. No, she said, drawing a deep breath. No, it's not that. Look at that room. Following her slight gesture, Ash looked. It was an old, low-ceiling room, panelled in white and gold, showing here and there an Italian picture, saint or holy family, agreeable schoolwork, from which might be inferred the tastes, if not the expertise, of Madame Destre's first husband, Lord Blackwater. The floor was held by a plentiful collection of seats, neither too easy nor too stiff, arranged by one who understood to perfection the physical conditions at least which should surround the great art of conversation. At this moment, every seat was full. A sea of black coats overflowed on the farther side, into the staircase landing, where, through the open door, several standing groups could be seen. And, in the inner room, where they sat, there was but little space between its margin and themselves. It was a remarkable sight, and in his past visits to the house, Ash had often said to himself that the elements of which he was made up were still more remarkable. Ministers and opposition, ambassadors, travellers, journalists, the men of fashion and the men of reform, here a French Republican official, and beyond him, perhaps, a man whose ancestors were already of the most ancient noblesse in St. Simon's Day. Artists, great and small, men of letters, good and indifferent, all these had been among the guests of Madame d'Estre, brought to the house, each of them, for some quality's sake, some power of keeping up the social game. But now, as he looked at the room, not to please himself, but to obey Lady Kitty, Ash became aware of a new impression. The crowd was no less numerically than he had seen it in the early winter, but it seemed to him less distinguished, made up of coarser and commoner items. He caught the face of a shady financier long since banished from Lady Tramwell's parties. Beyond him, a red-faced colonel, conspicuous alike for doubtful money matters and matrimonial trouble. And in a farther corner, a sallow profile of a writer whose books were apt to rouse even the man of the world to a healthy and contemptuous disgust. Surely these persons had never been there of old. He could not remember one of them. He looked again, more closely. Was it fancy, or was the gathering itself aware of the change which had passed over it? As a whole, it was certainly noisier than of old. The shouting and laughter were incessant. But within the general uproar, certain groups had separated from other groups and were talking with a studied quiet. Most of the habitués were still there, but they held themselves apart from their neighbours. Were the old intimacy and solidarity beginning to break up? And with them, the peculiar charm of these evenings, a charm which had so far defied a social boycott that had been active from the first? He glanced back uncertainly at Lady Kitty, and she looked at him. Why are there no ladies? she said abruptly. He collected his thoughts. It, uh, it has always been a men's gathering, perhaps for some men here. I'm sorry there are such barbarians, Lady to Kitty. That makes the charm of it. Look at that old fellow there. He's a most famous old boy. Everybody invites him. But he never stirs out of his den but to come here. My mother can't get him, though she has tried often. And he pointed to a dishevelled, grey-haired gentleman, short in stature, round in figure, something in short like an animated egg, who was addressing a group not far off. Lady Kitty's face showed a variety of expressions. Are there many parties like this in London? Are the ladies asked and don't come? I, I don't understand. Ash looked at her kindly. There's no other hostess in London as clever as your mother, he declared, and then tried to change the subject, but she paid no heed. 
The other day at Aunt Grossville's, she said slowly, I asked if my two cousins might come tonight, and they looked at me as though I were mad. Oh, do talk to me. She came impulsively nearer, and Ash noticed that Darrell, standing against the doorway of communication, looked round at them in amusement. I liked your face the very first moment when I saw you across the room. Do you know you're... you're very handsome? She drew back, her eyes fixed gravely, intently upon him. For the first time, Ash was conscious of annoyance. I hope you won't mind my saying so. His tone was a little short. But in this country we don't say those things. They're not quite polite. Aren't they? Her eyebrows arched themselves, and her lips fell in penitence. I always called my French cousin Henri Lafresne, beau. I'm sure he liked it. The accent was almost plaintive. Ash's natural impulse was to say that if so, the French cousin must be an ass. But all in a moment he found himself seized with the desire to take her little hands in his own and press them. She looked such a child, so exquisite and so forlorn. And he did, in fact, bend forward confidentially, forgetting Darrell. I want you to come and see my mother, he said, smiling at her. Ask Lady Grossville to bring you. May I? But... She searched his face, eager still to pour out the impulsive, uncontrolled confidences that were in her mind. But his expression stopped her, and she gave a little resentful smile. Yes, I'll come. We, you and I, are a little bit cousins too, aren't we? We talked about you at the Grossvilles. Was our great-great the same person, he said, laughing. Hope it was a decent great-great. Some of mine aren't much to boast of. Well, at any rate, let's be cousins, whether we are or no, shall we? She assented, her whole face lighting up. And we're going to meet the week after next, she said triumphantly, in the country. Are we? At Graceful Park? That's delightful. And then I'll ask your advice. I'll make you tell me a hundred things. That's a bargain, mind. Kitty, come and help me with tea. There's a darling. Lady Kitty turned. A path had opened through the crowd, and Madame Destre, much escorted, a vision of diamonds and pale pink satin, appeared, leading the way to the supper room, and the light refection, accompanied by much champagne, which always closed these evenings. The girl rose, as did her companion also. Madame Destre threw a quick, half-satirical glance at Ash, but he had eyes only for Lady Kitty and her transformation at the touch of her mother's voice. She followed Madame Destre with a singular and conscious dignity, her white skirt sweeping, her delicately fine head thrown back on her thin neck and shoulders. The black crowd closed about her, and Ash's eyes pursued the slender figure till it disappeared. Extreme youth, innocence, protest, pain, was it with these touching and pleading impressions, after all, that his first talk with Kitty Bristol had left him? Yet what a little étourdi! How lacking in the reserves, the natural instincts and shrinkings of the well-bred English girl! Darrell and Ash walked home together, through a windy night which was bringing out April scents even from the London grass and lilac bushes. Well, said Darrell as they stepped into the Green Park, so you're safely in. Congratulate you, old fellow. Anything else? Yes, they've offered me Hickson's place. More fools, eh, don't you think? Good. Upon my word, Bill, you've got your foot in the stirrup now. Hope you'll continue to be civil to poor devils like me. The speaker looked up, smiling, but neither the tone nor the smile was really cordial. Ash felt the embarrassment that he had once or twice felt before in telling Darrell news of good fortune. There seemed to be something in Darrell that resented it, under an outer show of felicitation. However, they went on talking of the political moment and its prospects, and of Ash's personal affairs. As to the last, Darrell questioned, and Ash somewhat reluctantly replied. It appeared that his allowance was to be largely raised, that his paralysed father, in fact, was anxious to put him in possession of a substantial share in the income of the estates, that one of the country houses was to be made over to him, and so on. Which means, of course, that they want you to marry, said Darrell. Well, you've only to throw the handkerchief. They were passing a lamp as he spoke, and the light shone on his long, pale face, a face of discontent with its large, sunken eyes and hollow cheeks. 
Ash treated the remark as rot, and endeavoured to get away from his own affairs by discussing the party they had just left. How does she get all those people together? It's astonishing. Well, I always liked Madame Destre well enough, said Darrell, but upon my word she has done a beastly mean thing in bringing that girl over. You mean, Ash hesitated, that her own position is too doubtful? Doubtful, my dear fellow, Darrell laughed unpleasantly. I never really understood what it all meant till the other night, when old Lady Grosfield took and told me, more at any rate than I knew before, the Grosfields are on the warpath, and they regard the coming of this poor child as the last straw. Why? said Ash. Darrell gave a shrug. Well, you know the story of Madame Destre's stepdaughter, old Blackwater's daughter. Ah, by his first marriage. I knew it was something about the stepdaughter, said Ash vaguely. Darrell began to repeat his conversation with Lady Grosville. A tale threatened presently to become a black one indeed. And at last Ash stood still in the broad walk crossing the green park. Look here, he said resolutely. Don't tell me any more. I don't want to hear any more. Why? asked Darrell in amazement. Because, Ash hesitated a moment, well, I don't want it to be made impossible for me to go to Madame Destre's again. Besides, we've just eaten her salt. You're a good friend, said Darrell, not without something of a sneer. Ash was ruffled by the tone, but tried not to show it. He merely insisted that he knew Lady Grosville to be a bit of an old cat, that of course there was something up, but it seemed a shame for those at least who accepted Madame Destro's hospitality to believe the worst. There was a curious mixture of carelessness and delicacy in his remarks, very characteristic of the man. It appeared as though he was at once too indolent to go into the matter, and too chivalrous to talk about it. Darrell presently maintained a rather angry silence. No man likes to be checked in his story, especially when the check implies something like a snub from his best friend. Suddenly, memory brought before him the little picture of Ash and Lady Kitty together, he bending over her in his large, handsome geniality, and she looking up. Darrell felt a twinge of jealousy, then disgust. Really, men like Ash had the world too easily their own way. That they should pose, besides, was too much. End of Part 1 Chapter 2Part 1 Chapter 3 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Plot One, Chapter Three. Rather more than a fortnight after the evening at Madame Destre's, William Ash found himself in a midland train on his way to the Cambridgeshire house of Lady Grosville. While the April country slipped past him, like some blanched face to which life and colour are returning, Ash divided his time between an idle skimming of the Saturday papers and a no less idle dreaming of Kitty Bristol. He had seen her two or three times since his first introduction to her, once at a ball to which Lady Grosfield had taken her, and once on the terrace of the House of Commons, where he had strolled up and down with her for a most amusing and stimulating hour while her mother entertained a group of elderly politicians. And the following day she had come alone, her own choice, to take tea with Lady Tranmore on that lady's invitation, as prompted by her son. Ash himself had arrived towards the end of the visit, and had found a Lady Kitty in the height of fashion, stiff-mannered, and flushed to a deep red by her own consciousness that she could not possibly be making a good impression. At sight of him she relaxed, and talked a great deal, but not wisely. And when she was gone, Ash could get very little opinion of any kind from his mother, who had, however, expressed a wish that she should come and visit them in the country. Since then he frankly confessed to himself that in the intervals of his new official and administrative work he had been a good deal haunted by memories of this strange child, her eyes, her grace, even her fits of proud shyness, and the way in which, as he had put her into her cab after the visit to Lady Tramwell, her tiny hand had lingered in his, a mute, astonishing appeal. Haunted, too, by what he heard of her fortunes and surroundings. What was the real truth of Madame Destre's situation? 
During the preceding weeks, some ugly rumours had reached Ash of financial embarrassment in that quarter, of debts risen to mountainous height, of crisis and possible disappearance. Then these rumours were met by others, to the effect that Colonel Warrington, the old friend and supporter of the Destre's household, had come to the rescue, that the crisis had been averted, and that the three weekly evenings, so well known and so well attended, would go on. And with this phase of the story, there mingled, as de Ash was well aware, not the slightest breath of scandal, in a case where, so to speak, all was scandal. And meanwhile, what new and dolorous truths had Lady Kitty been learning as to her mother's history and her mother's position? By Jove, it was hard upon the girl. Darrow was right. Why not leave her to her French friends and relations, or relinquish her to Lady Crossville? Madame Destres had seen little or nothing of her for years. She could not, therefore, be necessary to her mother's happiness, and there was a real cruelty in thus claiming her at the very moment of her entrance into society, where Madame Destres could only stand in her way. For, although many a man whom the girl might profitably marry was to be found among the mother's guests, the influences of Madame Destre's evenings were certainly not matrimonial. Still, the unforeseen was surely the probable in Lady Kitty's case. What sort of man ought she to marry? What sort of man could safely take the risks of marrying her, with that mother in the background? He descended at the wayside station prescribed to him, and looked round him for fellow guests, much as the card player examined his hand. Mary Lister, a cabinet minister, filling an ornamental office and handed on from ministry to ministry as a kind of necessary appendage, the public never knew why. The minister's second wife, an attaché from the Austrian embassy, two members of parliament and a well-known journalist. Ash said to himself flippantly that so far the trumps were not many. But he was always reasonably glad to see Mary, and he went up to her, cared for her bag, and made her put on her cloak with cousinly civility. In the omnibus on the way to the house, he and Mary gossiped in a corner, while the cabinet minister and the editor went to sleep, and the two members of parliament practised some courageous French on the Austrian attaché. "'Is it to be a large party?' he asked of his companion. "'No, they always fill the house. A good many came down yesterday.' "'Well, I'm not curious,' said Ash, except as to one person. "'Who?' "'Lady Kitty Bristol.' Mary Lister smiled. Yes, poor child, I heard from the Graceville girls that she was to be here. Why poor child? I don't know. Quite the wrong expression, I admit. I should be poor hostess. Oh, the Gracefields complain. No, they're only on tenterhooks. They never know what she will do next. How good for the Gracefields. You think society is the better for shocks? Lady Gracefield can do with them anyway. What a masterful woman. But I'll back Lady Kitty. I haven't seen her yet, said Mary. I hear she's a very odd-looking little thing. Extremely pretty, said Ash. Really? Mary lifted incredulous eyebrows. Well, now I shall know what you admire. <laughs> My tastes are horribly Catholic. I admire so many people, said Ash, with a glance at the well-dressed elegance beside him. Mary coloured a little, unseen, and the rattle of the carriage as it entered the covered porch of Graceville Park cut short their conversation. "'Well, I'm glad you got in,' said Lady Graceville, in her full, loud voice, "'because we are connections. But, of course, I regard the loss of a seat to our side just now as a great disaster.' "'Very grasping on your part,' said Ash. "'You've had it all your own way lately. Think of Portsmouth.' Lady Graceville, however, as she met his bantering look, did not find herself at all inclined to think of Portsmouth. She was much more inclined to think of William Ash. What a good-looking fellow he had grown. She heaved an inward sigh of mingled envy and appreciation, directed towards Lady Tranmore. Poor Susan, indeed, had suffered terribly in the death of her eldest son. But the handsomer and abler of the two brothers still remained to her, and the estate was safe. Lady Graceville thought of her own three daughters, plain and almost dialless, and of that conceited young man, the heir, whom she could hardly persuade her husband to invite once a year for appearance sake. 
Well, why are we so early? said Ash, looking at his watch. I thought I should be disgracefully late. For he and Lady Grosville had the library to themselves. It was a fine book-walled room with Chiello antico columns and Adam decoration, and in its richly coloured lamplit space the seated figure, stiffly erect, of Lady Grosville, her profile, said by some to be like a horse, and by others to resemble Savonarola, the cap of old Venice point that crowned her grizzled hair, a black velvet dress, and the long-fingered, ugly, yet distinguished hands which lay upon her lap, told significantly, especially when contrasted with the negligent ease and fresh-coloured youth of her companion. Grosville Park was rich in second-rate antiques, and there was a Greco-Roman head above the bookcase with which Ash had been often compared. As he stood now, leaning against the fireplace, the close-piled curls and eyes, somewhat a fleur de tit of the bust, were undoubtedly repeated with some closeness in the living man. Those whom he had offended by some social carelessness or other said of him when they wished to run him down that he was floridly handsome, and there was some truth in it. "'Didn't you get the message about dinner?' said Lady Grisville. Then, as he shook his head, "'Very remiss of Parkin. I always tell him he loses his head directly the party goes into double figures. We had to put off dinner a quarter of an hour because of Kitty Bristol, who missed her train at St Pancras and only arrived half an hour ago. By the way, I don't suppose you have already seen her at that woman's?' "'I met her a week or two ago at Madame d'Estrée's,' said Ash apparently preoccupied with something wrong in the set of his white waistcoat. "'What did you think of her?' "'A charming young lady,' said Ash, smiling. "'What else should I think?' "'A lamb thrown to the wolves,' said Lady Grisville, grimly. "'How that woman could do such a thing!' "'I saw nothing lamb-like about Lady Kitty,' said Ash. "'And do you include me among the wolves?' Lady Grisville hesitated a moment, then stuck to her colours. "'You shouldn't go to such a house,' she said boldly. "'I suppose I may say that without offence, William, as I've known you from a boy.' "'Say anything you like, my dear Lady Grosville. "'So you believe evil things of Madame d'Estrée?' His tone was light, but his eyes sought the distant door, as though invoking some fellow guest to appear and protect him. Lady Grosville did not answer. Ash's look returned to her and he was startled by the expression of her face. He had always known, and unwillingly admired her, for a fine Old Testament Christian, one from whom the language of the imprecatory psalms with regard to her enemies, personal and political, might have flowed more naturally than from any other person he knew of the same class of breeding. But this loathing, this passion of contempt, this heat of memory, these were new indeed, and the fire of them transfigured the old grey face. "'I have known a fair number of bad people,' said Lady Grosville, in a low voice, "'and a good many wicked women. "'But for beatness and vileness combined, "'the things I know of the woman who was Blackwater's wife "'have no equal in my experience.' There was a moment's pause. Then Ash said, in a voice as serious as her own, "'I am sorry to hear you say that.' partly because I like Madame d'Estrées, and partly because I, I was particularly attracted by Lady Kitty. Lady Graceville looked up sharply. Don't marry her, William. Don't marry her. She comes of a bad stock. Ash recovered his gaiety. She is your own niece. Mightn't a man dare on, on that guarantee? Not at all, said Lady Graceville, unappeased. I was a hop out of kin. Besides, a Methodist governess saved me. She converted me at eighteen, and I owe her everything. But my brothers, and all the rest of us. She threw up her eyes and hands. What's the good of being mealy-mouthed about it? All the world knows it. A good many of us were mad, and I sometimes think I see more than eccentricity in Kitty. Who was Madame d'Estre? said Ash. Why should he wince so at the girl's name, in that hard mouth? Lady Grisville smiled. "'Well, I can tell you a good deal about that,' she said. "'Ah, another time.' And the door opened, and in came a group of guests with a gush of talk and a rustling of silks and satins. 
everybody was gathered, dinner had been announced, and the white-haired and gouty Lord Graceville was in a state of seething impatience that not even the mild-voiced dean of the neighbouring cathedral, engaged in complimenting him on his speech at the Darson conference, could restrain. Adelina need be wait any longer, said the master of the house, turning an angry eye upon his wife. Certainly not. She's had ample time, said Lady Graceville, and rang the bell beside her. Suddenly there was a whirlwind of noise in the hall, the angry barking of a small dog, the sound of a girl's voice laughing and scolding, the swish of silk skirts. A scandalised butler, obeying Lady Graceville's summons, threw the door open, and in burst Lady Kitty. Oh, I'm so sorry, said the newcomer, in a tone of despair. But I couldn't leave him upstairs, Aunt Lena. He's eaten one of my shoes and begun upon the other. And Judy's afraid of him. He bit her last week. May he sit on my knee? I know I can keep him quiet. Every conversation in the library stopped. Twenty amazed persons turned to look. They beheld a slim girl in white at the far end of the large room, struggling with a grey terrier puppy which she held under her left arm and turning appealing eyes towards Lady Graceville. The dog, half frightened, half fierce, was barking furiously. Lady Kitty's voice could hardly be heard through the din, and she was crimson with the efforts to control her charge. Her lips laughed, her eyes implored, and, to add to the effect of the apparition, a marked strangeness of dress was at once perceived by all the English eyes turned upon her. Lady Kitty was robed in the extreme of French fashion, which at that moment was a fashion of flounces. She was much décolleté, and her fair, abundant hair, carried to a great height and arranged with a certain calculated wildness around her small face, was surmounted by a large scarlet butterfly, which shone defiantly against the dark background of books. Kitty, said Lady Graceville, advancing indignantly, what a dreadful noise! Pray give the dog to park in at once. Lady Kitty only held the struggling animal tighter. Please, Aunt Lyanna, I'm afraid he'll bite, but he'll be quite good with me. Why did you bring him, Pit Kitty? We can't have such a creature at dinner, said Lady Graceville angrily. Lord Graceville advanced behind his wife. How do you do, Kitty? Haven't you better put down the dog and come and be introduced to Mr Rankin, who is to take you into dinner? Lady Kitty shook her fair head, but advanced, still clinging to the dog gave a smile and a nod to Ash, and a bow to the young Tory member presented to her. "'You don't mind him?' she said, a flash of laughter in her dark eyes. "'We'll manage him between us, won't we?' The young man, dazzled by her prettiness and her strangeness, murmured a hopeful assent. Lord Graceville, with the air of a man determined on dinner through the sky's fall, offered his arm to Lady Edith Manley, the wife of the Cabinet Minister, and made for the dining-room. A stream of guests followed, when suddenly the puppy, perceiving on the floor a ball of wool which had rolled out of Lady Graceville's work table, escaped in an ecstasy of mischief from his mistress's arm and flew upon the ball. Kitty rushed after him. The wool first unrolled, then caught. The table overturned, and all its contents were flung pell-mell in the path of Lady Graceville, who, on the arm of the amused and astonished minister, was waiting in restrained fury till her guests should pass. I shall never get over this, said Lady Kitty, as she leaned back in her chair, still panting and quite incapable of eating any of the foods that were being offered to her in quick succession. I don't know that you deserve to, said Ash, turning a face upon her which was as grave as he could make it. The attention of everyone else round the room was also, in truth, occupied with his companion. There was indeed a general buzz of conversation and a general pretense that Lady Kitty's proceedings might now be ignored. But in reality, every guest, male or female, kept a stealthy watch on the red butterfly and the sparkling face beneath it, and Ash was well aware of it. "'If I was not my fault,' said Kitty, with dignity, "'I was not allowed to have the dog I should have had. "'You'd never have found a dog of St Hubert condescending to bedroom slippers. "'But as I had to have a dog,' and Colonel Warrington gave me this one three days ago, and he has already ruined half mammals and things, and no one could manage him but me. I just had to bring him and trust to Providence. 
I have been here a good many times, said Ash, and I never yet saw a dog in the sanctuary. Do you know that Pitt once wrote a speech in the library? Did he? I'm sure he never made such a stir as Ponto did. Kitty's face suddenly broke into laughter, and she hid it a moment in her hands. You brazen it out, said Ash, but how are you going to appease Lady Groseville? Kitty ceased to laugh. She drew herself up and looked seriously, observantly, at her aunt. I don't know, but I must do it somehow. I don't want any more worries. So changed were her tone and aspect that Ash turned a friendly, examining look upon her. Have you been worried? he said in a lower voice. She shrugged her shoulders and made no reply, but presently she impatiently reclaimed his attention, snatching it from the lady he'd taken into dinner with no scruple at all. Will you come a walk with me tomorrow morning? Proud, said Ash. What time? As soon as we can get rid of these people, she said, her eye running round the table. Then, as it paused and lingered on the face of Mary Lister opposite, she abruptly asked him who that lady might be. Ash informed her. Your cousin, she said, looking at him with a slight frown. Your cousin? I tell well, I don't think I shall like her. That's a great pity, said Ash. For me, she said distrustfully. For both, of course. My mother's very fond of Miss Lister. She's often with us. Oh, said Kitty, and looked again at the face opposite. Then he heard her say behind her fan, half to herself and half to him. She does not interest me in the least. She has no ideas. I'm sure she has no ideas. Has she? She turned abruptly to Ash. Everyone calls her very clever. Kitty looked contempt. That's nothing to do with it. It's not the clever people who have ideas. Ash bantered her a little on the meaning of her words, till he presently found that she was too young and unpractised to be able to take his thrusts and return them with equanimity. She could make a daring sally or reply, but it was still the raw material of a conversation. It wanted ease and polish. And she was evidently conscious of it herself, for presently her cheek flushed and her manner wavered. I suppose you, everybody, thinks her very agreeable, she said sharply, her eyes returning to Miss Lister. She's a most excellent gossip, said Ash. I always go to her for the news. Kitty glanced again. I can see that already she detests me. In half an hour? The girl nodded. She's looked at me twice, about, but she's made up her mind, and she never changes. Then, with an abrupt alteration of note, she looked round the room. I suppose your English dining rooms are all like this. One might be sitting in a hearse. The pictures, no, quelle horreur. She raised her shoulders again impetuously, frowning at a huge full-length opposite of Lord Grosville as MFH, a masterpiece indeed of early Victorian vulgarity. Then, suddenly, hastily, with that flashing softness which so often transformed her expression, she turned towards him, trying to make amends. But the library, that was bien. Ah, très, très bien. Her eyes rolled a little as she spoke with a charming effect, and she looked at him radiantly, as though to strike and to make amends were equally her prerogative, and she asked to no man's leave. You've not yet seen what there is to see here, said Ash, smiling. Look behind you. The girl turned her slim neck and exclaimed, for behind Ash's chair was the treasure of the house. It was A Dance of Children by one of the most famous of the 18th century masters. From the dark wall it shone out with a flower-like brilliance, a vision of colour and of grace. The children danced through a golden air, their bodies swaying to one of those unheard melodies of art, sweeter than all mortal tunes, their delicate faces alive with joy. The sky and grass and trees seemed to caress them. The soft sunlight clothed them, and flowers brushed their feet. Kitty turned back again, and was silent. Was it Ash's fancy, or had she grown pale? Did you like it? he asked her. She turned to him, and for the second time in their acquaintance he saw her eyes floating in tears. It is too beautiful, she said with an effort, almost an angry effort. I, I, I don't want to see it again. I thought it would give you pleasure, said Ash gently, 
suddenly conscious of a hope that she was not aware of the slight look of amusement with which Mary Lister was contemplating them both. So it did, said Kitty, furtively applying her lace handkerchief to her tears. But, her voice dropped, when one's unhappy, very unhappy, things like that, things like heaven, hurt. Oh, what a fool I am! And she sat straightly up, looking round her. There was a pause. Then Ash said in another voice, Look here, you know this won't do. I thought we were to be cousins. Well, said Kitty indifferently, not looking at him, and I understood that I was to be taken into respectable cousinly counsel. Well, said Kitty again, crumbling her bread, I can't do it here, can I? Ash laughed. Well, anyhow, we're going to sample the garden tomorrow morning, aren't we? I suppose so, said Kitty. Then, after a moment, she looked at her right-hand neighbour, the young politician to whom as yet she had scarcely vouchsafed a word. What's his name? she asked under her breath. Ash repeated it. Perhaps I ought to talk to him. Of course you ought, said Ash, with smiling decision, and, turning to the lady whom he brought in, he left her free. When the ladies rose, Lady Grosville led the way to the large drawing-room, a room which, like the library, had some character, and a thin elegance of style, not, however, warmed and harmonised by the delightful presence of books. The walls, blue and white in colour, were panelled in stucco relief. A few family portraits, stiff handlings of stiff people, were placed each in the exact centre of its respective panel. There were a few cases of china and a few polished tables, a crimson Brussels carpet, chosen by Lady Grosville for its cheerfulness, covered the floor, and there was a large white sheepskin rug before the fireplace. A few hearthstones in pots, and the bright fire supplied the only gay and living notes before the ladies arrived. Still, for an English eye, the room had a certain cold charm, was, moreover, full of history. It hardly deserved at any rate the shiver with which Kitty Bristol looked round it. But she had little time to dwell upon the room and its meanings, for Lady Graceful approached her with a manner which still showed signs of the catastrophe before dinner. Kitty, I think you don't know Miss Lister yet. Mary Lister. She wants to be introduced to you. Mary advanced, smiling. Kitty held out a limp hand, and they exchanged a few words standing in the centre of the floor, while the other guests found seats. What a charming contrast! said Lady Edith Manley in Lady Grosville's ear. She nodded, smiling towards the standing pair, struck by the fine straight lines of Mary's satin dress, the roundness of her fine figure, the oval of her head and face, and then by the little, vibrating, tempestuous creature beside her, so distinguished, if I spite of the billowing flounces and ribbons, so direct and significant amid all the elaboration. Kitty is ridiculously overdressed, said Lady Grosville, I hope we shall soon change that. My girls are going to take her to their woman. Lady Edith put up her eyeglass slowly and looked at the two graceful girls, then back at Kitty. Meanwhile, a few perfunctory questions and answers were passing between Miss Lister and her companion. Mary's aspect, as she talked, was extremely amiable. One might have called it indulgent, perhaps even by an adjective that implied a yet further shade of delicate superiority. Kitty met it by the same grand manner that Ash had several times observed in her, a manner caught perhaps from some French model and caricatured in the taking. Her eyes, meanwhile, took note of Mary's face and dress, and while she listened, her small teeth tormented her under lip, as though she restrained impatience. All at once, in the midst of some information that Miss Lister was lucidly giving, Kitty made an impetuous turn. She caught some words on the farther side of the room, and she looked hard, eagerly, at the speaker. "'Who is that?' she inquired. Mary Lister, with a sharp sense of interruption, replied that she believed the lady in question was the Grosville's French governess. But in the very midst of her sentence, Kitty deserted her, left her standing in the centre of the drawing-room, while the deserter fled across it, and, sinking down beside the astonished mademoiselle, took the Frenchwoman's hand by assault, and held it in both her own. Vous parlez français? Vous êtes français? Ah, ça me fait tant de bien. Voyons, voyons, cause un peu. Bending forward, she broke into a cataract of French, 
all the elements of her strange small beauty rushing as it were into flame and movement at the swift sound and cadence of the words like a dancer kindled by music the occasion was of the slightest a frenchwoman might well show a natural bewilderment but into the slight occasion the girl threw an animation a passion that glorified it it was like the leap of a wild rain stream on the mountains that pours into the first channel which presents itself what beautiful french said lady edith softly to mary lister who found a seat beside her mary lister smiled she has been at school of course in a french convent somehow the tone implied that the explanation disposed of all merit in the performance i am afraid these french convent schools are not at all what they should be said lady graceville and rising to a pyramidal height her ample moire dress swelling behind her her grey head magnificently crowned by its lace cap of black velvet bandeau she swept across the room to where the dean's wife mrs winston sat in fascinated silence observing lady kitty the silence and the attention annoyed her host the first thing to be done with girls of this type it seemed to lady graceville was to prove to them that they would not be allowed to monopolize society there are natural monopolies however and they are not easy to deal with as soon as the gentleman returned mr rankin whom she treated so badly at dinner the young agent of the estate the clergyman of the parish the austrian attache the cabinet minister and the dean all showed a strong inclination to that side of the room which seemed to be held in force by lady kitty the dean especially was not to be gainsaid he placed himself in the seat shyly vacated by the french governess and crossed his thin stockinged legs with the air of one who means to take his ease there was even a certain curious resemblance between him and kitty as was noticed from a distance by ash the dean who was very much a man of the world and came of an historic family was in his masculine degree planned on the same miniature scale and with the same fine finish as the girl of eighteen and he carried his knee breeches his apron and his exquisite white head with a natural charm and energy akin to hers mellowed though it were by time and dignified by office he began eagerly to talk to her of paris his father had been ambassador for a time under louis philippe and he had boyish memories of the great house in the faubourg saint honore and of the orleanist ministers and men of letters and lo kitty met him at once in a glow and sparkle that enchanted the old man moreover it appeared that this much beflounced young lady could talk that she had heard of the famous names and the great affairs to which the dean made allusion that she possessed indeed a native and surprising interest in matters of the sort and a manner above all with the old alternately soft and daring calculated as lady graceful would no doubt have put it merely to make fools of them in her cousin's house it seemed she talked with old people survivors of the orleanist bourbon regimes even of the empire had sat at their feet a small excited hero worshipper and had then rushed blindly into the memoirs and books that concerned them so in this french world the child had found time for other things than hunting and the flattery of her cousin henri ash was supposed to be devoting himself to the dean's wife but both he and she listened most of the time to the sallies and the laughter of the circle where kitty presided my dear young lady cried the delighted dean i never find anybody who can talk of these things it is really astonishing ah now we english know nothing of france nor they of us why i was a mere schoolboy then and i had a passion for their society and their books for their plays dare i confess it he lowered his voice and glanced at his hostess their plays above all kitty clapped her hands the dean looked at her and ran on my mother shared it when i came over for my eton holidays she and i lived at the theatre francais ah those were the days i remember mademoiselle moire's in hernani kitty bounded in her seat whereupon it appeared that just before she left paris she had been taken by a friend to see the reigning idol of the comedie francaise the young and astonishing actress sarah bernhardt as Donia sol and there began straight away an excited duet between her and the dean a comparison of old and new a rivalry of heroines 
a hot and critical debate that presently silenced all other conversation in the room, and brought Lord Grosfield to stand gaping and astounded behind the Dean, reflecting, no doubt, that this was not precisely the Dean of the Diocesan Conference. The old man, indeed, forgot his age, the girl her youth. They met as equals on poetic ground, till suddenly Kitty, springing up and to prove her point, began an imitation of Sarah in the great love scene of the last act, before arresting fate in the person of Dorui, breaks in upon the rapture of the lovers. She absolutely forgot the Grosfield drawing-room, the staring Grosfield girls, the other faces, astonished or severe, neutral or friendly. Out rolled the tide of tragic verse, fine poetry and high passion. And though it be not very much to say, it must at least be said that never had such recitation in such French been heard before within the walls of Graceville Park. Nor had the lips of any English girl ever dealt there with a poetic diction so unchastened and unashamed. Lady Graceville might well feel as though the solid frame of things were melting and cracking around her. Kitty ceased. She fell back upon her chair, smitten with a sudden perception. You made me, she said reproachfully to the dean. The dean said another brava, and gave another clap. Then, becoming aware of Lord Grosfield's open mouth and eye, he sat up, caught his wife's expression, and came back to prose and the present. My dear young lady, he began, you have the most extraordinary talent. When Lady Grosfield advanced upon him, Standing before him, she majestically signalled to her husband across his small person. William, kindly order Mrs. Wilson's carriage. Lord Grosfell awoke from his stupor with a jerk, and did as he was told. Mrs. Wilson, the agent's timid wife, who was not at all aware that she had asked for her carriage, rose obediently. Then the mistress of the house turned to Lady Kitty. You recite very well, Kitty, she said with cold and stately emphasis. But another time I'll ask you to confine yourself to Racine and Corneille. In England we have to be very careful about French writers. There are, however, if I remember right, some fine passages in Atalie. Kitty said nothing. The Austrian attaché, who had been following the little incident with the liveliest interest, retired to a close inspection of the china. But the dean, whose temper was of the quick and chivalrous kind, was roused. She recites wonderfully. Victor Hugh is a classic please, my lady, just as much as the rest of them. Ah, well, no doubt, no doubt there might be things more suitable. And the old man came wavering down to earth, as the enthusiasm which Kitty had breathed into him escaped, like the gas from a blue. But do you know, Lady Kitty? He struck into a new subject with eagerness, partly to cover the girl, partly to silence Lady Graceville. You remind me all the time so remarkably in your voice certain inflections of your sister your, your stepsister isn't it lady alice you know of course she is close to you today just the other side of the park with the sowbys the dean's wife sprang to her feet in despair in general it was to her a matter for fond complacency that her husband had no memory for gossip and was in such matters as innocent and as dangerous as a child but this was too much At the same moment ash came quickly forward my sister, said Kitty, my sister. She spoke low and uncertainly, her eyes fixed upon the dean. He looked at her with a sudden odd sense of something unusual, then went on, still floundering. Well, we met her at St Pancras on our way down. If I'd only known we would have had the pleasure of meeting you. Do you know I think she's looking decidedly better? His kindly expression as he rose expected a word of sisterly assent. Meanwhile, even Lady Grosfield was paralysed, and the words with which she had meant to interpose failed on her lips. Kitty, too, rose, looking round for something which she seemed to find in the face of William Ash, for her eyes clung there. My sister, she repeated in the same low, strained voice. My sister Alice? I'm, I don't know. I, I have never seen her. Ash could not remember afterwards precisely how the incident closed. There was a bustle of departing guests, and from the midst of it Lady Kitty slipped away. But as he came downstairs in smoking trim ten minutes later, he overheard the injured Dean wrestling with his wife as she lit a candle for him on the landing. My dear, what did you look at me like that for? What did the child mean? 
And what on earth is the matter? End of part one, chapter three.